Yeah, Arthur, just, uh, you know, where are you at? You feel you got your new people in place, 20 days. Uh, you know, where are we at? Uh, where's the arrow pointing football-wise as we'll be getting into the free agency first and uh, then the draft here over the next few weeks? Well, yeah, I think, you know, we're as well positioned now. Hey, Jeff, uh, we're as well positioned now, I, uh, I think, as we as we could be. Um, we were very thoughtful throughout the whole process. Lord knows how many people we interviewed on the coach side and the GM side. And it, it was a very intense two week period of time. I, I thought, you know, at one point I thought it was me and my age. But, you know, one day Rich called me and said, I'm exhausted. And, you know, Rich is a whole lot of years younger than I am and in great physical shape. He said, I've just, you know, so it was a very intense period of time. But we uh, I think we produced uh, the kind of results we we're proud of. I think we have a uh, 38 and 40 year old young, you know, general manager and young head coach that uh, have had both excellent backgrounds, are both very thoughtful, creative. Uh, I think they'll take a fresh look at, you know, our roster, which is what they will be doing or in the process of doing and um and and i think they'll they'll put us in a position where we can be very competitive again um and obviously we're thinking about the long term which is what we always should be thinking about so i'm you know i feel good right now and you know it's going to be another you know we'll say a crazy year but a crazy off season again i'm sure you all watched the commissioner's press conference today or, or read about it and you know, and that's been my impression in our discussions is that, you know, this is not going to be like a light switch. It's going to go from which everybody had hoped for 2020, 2021 would be totally different. You know, our off season will be some, you know, some blending of what we've seen this last year and probably leading into, you know, into the fall season. So, uh, um, so it, it, you know, it's going to take more work, more patience, more creativity, and more dedication. But I think, you know, I think it speaks well, in my opinion, for the league, for the medical staff, mostly I think for the players, the coaches, and the staff that were able to play 256 games and you know get to the playoffs and play them on time and and ending having a Super Bowl um, as scheduled. So I think all of that is is tremendous. But you know, eventually we got to get fans back in the building. So we all understand that. How how important will it be to um, ignite the fan base with that fourth pick and maybe take a Justin Fields at the quarterback position? I know Terry said he's going to take the best player available. Yeah, well, I, I would say the Saints have that that history. And you know, it's interesting. He told me in the interview process of his experience with Ozzie Newsom, who you know, we all know and is, you know, one of the more high, highly regarded general managers in the history of the league. I, you know, Ozzie has always had the position, has taken the position uh, you know, f- philosophically of drafting the best player regardless of need. And uh, I would say we always have not always, you know, always done that. Sometimes we've looked at need and uh, and moved towards need first. But uh, in any event, that's kind of a lot of his orientation. And the Saints have done that over the years, I think, too. And so, you know, it, it hurts me a little bit to say that he's coming from a great organization, but he is the Saints, and you know they've obviously um, built a, uh, a winning franchise, and he's been there for 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 18 years. He's worked with one of the most respected general managers in the league, Mickey Loomis, and uh, he's worked very closely with a, a highly, you know, highly regarded head coach. Uh, Sean Payton, who's not always the easiest person to work with, but his standards for excellence are extraordinarily high. So he's got a really good background, both on the pro side and since 2015 on the on the college side. So I, you know, I, I like his thinking. I like his thinking not only short term, you know, because it's important not only to put a winning team on the field next year, but to have a plan to have a sustainable winning team. You've all heard me say that many times over over the years. So. All right, go to Tori McElhaney with, with The Athletic. Arthur, I know you were on the call with Arthur Smith when we talked to him for his introductory press conference, but when he was talking about not wanting to have yes men on his staff and, and not wanting group think, I was just curious kind of from your business background, how you relate that to running a business, to building staffs around you and why that is so important. Well, I, I actually, I, that was one of the things when we were doing the interview with him that I, I actually really uh, wasn't excited to hear um, because, 
you know, and I want to take a minute to explain it, which sometimes they don't always have time to do. But, you know, the the lack of group think, I mean, you really want everybody to represent the best of their feelings, the best of their thoughts, their processes, where they are. On the other hand, you know, you've got to make a decision at the end of the day, but you want to get the best input from every single person that's involved in making a decision. And then you make a collective decision and you all get behind that decision. So whether it be taking the name off the board for a draft and making a decision about free agency or, you know, um, you know how you use a certain player, whatever it may be. What I got out of that is that he values the inclusion of everybody um, and then he'll he'll make the decision. And I think Terry functions the same way. I, I, I do think um, that it's one of the advantages of uh, his fa- that his father has had. I think it's a, a factor that his father has had on him, a positive factor, because his dad obviously is running, you know, a, a great corporation, started much like HD from nothing and built it. Um, so he's learned a lot of good principles and he was telling me that he chats with his dad sometimes once, twice a week about, you know, not about football stuff, about, you know, just, you know, being a manager, what does it take, how do you deal with this and that and everything. And his father obviously has had great experience with that. So I think, you know, I, I think his dad probably would say, you know, that's what you should be doing, you know, encourage everybody to think for themselves, represent themselves. At the end of the day, the coach or general manager or whoever it may be has got to make the final decision. So that doesn't mean, and one thing I would say, Terry, to give you a fullest answer, is that culturally, that means you're always on the same page, but your views may not always be the same. And culturally, that's one of the things that we talk about is uh, one of our slices of our value wheel is respect. Respect means that, you know, I may not always agree with Jeff Schultz, which is very rare. I almost always agree with Jeff Schultz, but I, I, but I may not agree with him. It doesn't mean that, you know, I, I, you know, I can't you know, listen to him and understand where he's coming from and and respond, you know, with, you know, with a degree of kindness. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. So um, anyway, I think it's very important to do that. And I think, you know, um, Terry didn't say that during his during exactly the same way, but he feels much the same way. And he said in New Orleans, that's the way they, they kind of ran, ran things down there. At the end of the day, he said Sean would make the decisions, but Sean did value the input of everybody. Yeah, I also did kind of want a personal anecdote from you. Maybe when's, what's an example throughout your career of, of a time that something came out of intense collaboration that you were really proud of? Well, I, I, I tell you, the, the, you know, Tor, it, it's interesting. I mean, what just came to my mind when you said that is when we, we had to deal with the Michael Vick situation. Um, and that was, a, you know, very... A very difficult time for uh, our fans. Very difficult time for our franchise, for our fans, uh, for the other players, uh, coaches, for everybody, including Michael. And so I think you know we spent you know time thinking about, including the league, because Michael was in some ways the face of the NFL at that time, just like you know Mahomes may be today or Brady maybe whatever. But you know Michael was in many ways. Um, so you know thinking about. Uh, getting the input of of uh, of all the people we were talking to was really important. And making a decision, what was the right decision for for our franchise, for our fans, for Michael, for the league, um, was something we decided on and, and moved forward with. But it took it took time to get you know to get to thinking of everybody. Um, so it wasn't kind of a it wasn't necessarily a blended decision, but it was a decision where you wanted to get the input of everybody. And then whatever path that took you on, it took you on. And then you made the decision going from there. And I think looking back, I think most people would say, and, you know, DL was here then and Jeff was here then. Um, You know, Zach was just a child then. But, you know, (laughs) but, you know, I mean, people would say that we generally handle that, I think, fairly well, given, you know, the difficulty of the moment. All right, we'll go to Zach Klein, WSB. And just a reminder, if you do have a question, type I have a question in the chat and we'll get to you in order of submission. Zach? Arthur, I know the health and safety of your fans is always at the forefront of your mind, but what's your optimism level uh, to have a capacity sellout crowd for the regular season um, this coming year? Yeah, that's a great question, Zach. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what Roger said today. I'm sure you watched it. I would say the same thing, what Roger said, is that you know, our aspiration is to have a full stadium. 
Um, but we're not going to make that decision. The decision will really be made by the scientists and by the you know medical councils and advisors. Um, so uh, we have to we have to put safety first. Um, we just can't compromise on that for our fans or you know for fans our fans our players coaches anybody in the building. Um, so I, I hopefully if Dr. Fauci is correct. And there's a lot that can slip between the cup and the lip, but you know, the doctor says potentially we can have between 80 to 85 of our adults vaccinated by sometime midsummer. We're at you know probably six percent now, maybe seven percent this week, something in that area. We've got a long way to go. We have to a long way to go in terms of convincing everybody, uh, all populations, that the vaccination should be taken. And then we have to work out these bugs that we're obviously living with across the nation in terms of not only the production, which I think will work out, I mean, I think the manufacturers will work out fine, but the, the, the distribution of the products and and having enough technicians, medical folks, doctors, nurses, et cetera, available to, you know, to do the injections. That's been a limitation. We, uh, at, the, at the stadium, at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, we're vaccinating probably, we're getting about 50% of the product from Fulton County currently, and we're only vaccinating between 1,700, 700 and 1,500 a day you know, aspirationally, the CDC thinks we set up to do as many as 15,000 a day. So we have to get to that point, but we need the product and we need people that can deliver the, the injections. So, uh, but I'm hopeful that'll work out. So we'll see. Hopefully that'll lead to a positive answer in the fall. Certainly much more positive than last year. I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dilett, I know you had several, so we'll go to your follow-up. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Arthur, I was just uh, looking at, uh, Rich was on the panel with Coach, uh, Coach Dungy, and he wrote an open letter to the owners about minority hiring. How do we move forward in the next cycle, um, make some progress with the GMs, but not so much, uh, in the coaching hiring? Well, you know, DL, I, I, you know, I serve on the, on the diversity committee for the league, so I'm, I'm, you know, very much aware of the rules and the trends and what have you, and I would say, particularly this year, uh, having to hire both a head coach and a GM, I think I can speak with some authority, uh, at least my view on what we saw. I think for both positions, the uh, quality of the candidate pool on on both sides was was uh, was a lot higher than I've ever seen in the past. Uh, it wasn't just a question of having diversity; it was a question of having diversity that was qualified. And so I I, I thought both for head coaches and GM that was definitely the case. Um, if you look at the head coaches, you know, there were seven opportunities, two were filled by diverse candidates. Um, you know, when you have 70 percent of your players are, you know, of color, you know, that's, you know, that's progress. But it's not really it's not really the kind of progress we had, we had hoped to see. Um, on the GM side, on the other hand, we had, you know, I mean, six openings this year and five of which half of which were filled by uh, by uh, by minorities. So I think there's great, you know, there's great progress there. The other thing I would say, and, and Roger brought it up today, but in my opinion, it's, it's worthwhile expanding a little bit. In, in, in some ways or in some way, you can argue that diversity at the general manager uh, position is not more important, but as important as the head coach. And I, and I, and I kind of would argue that because on average, uh, the GM will oversee transitions of between two to three head coaches. So if you have minority head coaches, the opportunities to uh, probably bring forward more head, more head coach candidates um, over that period of time through maybe several transitions is going to be greater. I also felt this year, looking at the uh, panel of the coordinators that each of the head coach candidates brought forward, I thought there were a lot of really diverse, great candidates that I think potentially are going to be, be head coaches in the future. So I think this progress made uh, not enough and not fast enough. And I think we'll go back and uh, the committee will re-examine uh, everything we did this year under a microscope. Um, we'll understand what we could have done better and, and work on those areas. I think the beauty is that you, you're going to find the league and ownership is going to be fully supportive of anything that we can do to enhance the policies and the rules to make it a little better. We'll go to Jeff Schultz from The Athletic. Hey, Arthur. Hey, Jeff. I know when you were uh, interviewing um, both Terry and Arthur, they um, 
they they had to lay out or they were asked to lay out, I'm sure their blueprint for your franchise. Mm-hmm. Are you at liberty at all to share what they said about both Matt Ryan and Julio Jones? Uh, yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. I, I think they uh, they both said that acknowledged and, and other players, but they acknowledged those are two very special athletes, two very very special players. They both acknowledged they're certainly not at the end of their road. Uh, Matt's performed at a high level since 2008. He's one of uh, only two quarterbacks in the history of the league that has thrown for more than 4,000 4, yards over a 10 year period. He and Drew Brees are the only two, and uh, Drew obviously is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, so Matt clearly can continue to play at a, you know, at a high level. Um, I think with Julio, uh, subject to, uh, you know, him staying healthy, which is not really, quote, his fault. He does whatever he can to keep in shape and stay in shape. And if he gets injured, usually it's a soft tissue injury um, to uh, keep himself on the field for the full season. Having said that, you know, and I would say this uh uh, in any context, whether it's a business context or a, or, or a franchise in a football context, one of the things that shareholders, and let's say if you are our fans as shareholders in this case, uh, and they as ownership in this case, they also expect you know you to prepare for the future. Uh, it's not just about performing for today. Is that okay? In this business of football, you're going to have athletes are going to age. Their skills are probably going to decline a little bit. Um, are you prepared for the future? And that's what good head coaches and good general managers do. And that's what, a, you know, good good owners do. They make sure they're hiring people who understand it's not just about winning next Sunday, but it's about winning, you know, on a, on a long, on a longer continuum than that. So my aspiration, I've said this publicly since 2001, is that we want to have a sustainable winning team, which means not just winning one year and then dropping down for two years and winning again, but Having a team that's competitive always and playing games in December and January that are important games and, you know, God willing, playing a game in February as well. So, um, you know, I, I think they're definitely part of their plans. And, and on the other hand, you know, they're, every everybody is aware that we all age, uh, players age, and you have to be thoughtful about when is the right time to make a transition. Transition doesn't have to be overnight. You look at the homes. You know, Patrick was drafted, you know, high performing player in college, came came out of a kind of a street football system. I say that respectfully. He probably would disagree and his coach then would. But in any event, you know, he needed to get, you know, some more training and more transition. He worked under a, you know, certainly a great quarterback in Alex Smith for a year. Um, that happened with Tom Brady. I mean, Tom didn't start for the, the Patriots until there was a, it was an injury. Uh Happened with Aaron Rodgers. Aaron, uh, you know, sat on the bench behind Brett Favre for the period of time. Um, we we're fortunate in this round. You know, we picked Cal Ridley several years ago. He's clearly a number one today. So the way we we're able to make a successful transition from Roddy to Julio, um, we'll you know be able to do that at some point, but not immediately. But at some point with Julio. So and that's what fans should really expect of us. I mean. You know, that that's our job. It's not just to win today, but to prepare for tomorrow. So we can win tomorrow as well. Sounds like you're drafting a quarterback. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, Jeff. That's, you know, that's your view. And I, I'm not, you know, I'm not the person going to take the card off the board. That's not my job. It's my job to have people who think about all those things. That is my job. Is it your expectation that Julio's back next year? Yeah, it's the same comment I made about Matt. I think they, you know, they all love Julio. Who wouldn't? Um, it's just a matter of him staying healthy and being on the field. You know, when he's when he's not on the field, you know, obviously it affects his ability to play. When he's on the field, he becomes a special player. And uh, when you put him in the mix with, you know, people like Cal Ridley and Gage and others, I mean, he becomes, you know, a real force. So, thanks. I, I don't think our biggest challenge is going to be in, in our receiver room. Uh, I think we uh, we have to establish a, a running game again. Uh, we've had one in the past, not over the last couple of years. And we establish a running game, it makes the passing game much easier. It makes your ability to control the game, control the clock, control the tempo of the game. Uh, it creates your ability to, to quote unquote, impose your will on the other team. So without it, it's very hard to do with, do those things. And we haven't had that, obviously, in the last few years. All right, got a follow up from Zach Klein. Who's winning Sunday? You know what? I think uh, I, I'm hoping. You know, 
that that fans will be winning on Sunday. I mean, I think it's a you know seriously. I think it's going to be a great matchup. It should be a great matchup. Um, uh, you've got you know two teams that truly deserve to be there. You've got you know two quarterbacks at opposite ends of excellence. One is 25, I think, Mahomes, and I think Tom is 43 and says now he's going to play to 53 or whatever it is. So. Uh, you know, you've got you know two you know you know two extraordinary teams uh, that both can score and put up a lot of points, and you have teams that you know well schooled on defense. So um, it should be a close game, and it should be a good game. So I'm I'm hopeful. So, and I mean, your heart of hearts, Arthur. Do you feel you're closer to getting back there, or there's still a long way to go? Oh yeah, no, I know. I, I certainly think we're close close to getting back there, but. You know, as you all know, and your students of the game and our fans are students of the game, is that, you know, when you get into the playoffs, it is single game elimination. So um, if you're in the the key is to get into the playoffs, you know, to get into the tournament. And if you're in the tournament, you have a chance, you know, and then you, you know, depends on how you're playing, what's happening with injuries you know, the ball's not round. Does it bounce in your favor versus somebody else's? There's an awful lot of things that come into into play. And. You know, sometimes, usually, and you get to the playoffs, it's only a, normally just a very small handful of plays that make a difference in a game. And sometimes there are, you know, there are things you can't always predict, turnover, turnovers, things of that nature. Got a follow-up from D-Led? Yeah, Arthur, has the uh, front office briefed you on the uh, salary cap situation? The uh, websites have you all... Uh, 33 to 36 million over. Uh, and, and then they said it's a baseline. DeMar said a baseline of 175. It may get higher. Yeah, I, I think I'll give you my own views on this. I, I think uh, we all understand, you know, where we are because it's, you know, it's it's information that's, you know, that's public. Um, I, I, I won't go as far as Rich sometimes will say, you know, we'll find a way to work around it. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I, and, and Rich is, you know, he's he's done it, been there, gotten the T-shirt. So I, I respect, you know, I respect what he says. Uh, but, um, you know, I think we'll probably have some difficult decisions to make this year. On the other hand, uh, I this is just my personal opinion. I have no no evidence of this, but my personal opinion is that the cap will not be at 175 this year. I think it'll be some number higher than that. And I think uh, the league probably with the NFLPA will take the position that let's, you know, take the damage of last year, uh, you know, the pain that we all incurred last year and spread it over some period of time. I don't think they'll make it a one year hit. Um, I think that would be, you know, too difficult. And I think really it's not in the best interest of not only uh, the league and the clubs, but our fans. Because you'd have, you'd have clubs that would have to be making some very difficult decisions on some very good players that uh, ordinarily they wouldn't, they wouldn't be doing. And I think it's really not what fans want to see. I mean, fans want to see their, you know, some, you know, some continuity with with their, with their most successful players. So I think there'll there'll be something worked out. Uh, not to say it's going to be easy, but I think it'll be workable. Go to Ken Belson. Hey, Ken. Hey, uh, Arthur. Um, thanks for um, fielding the question. I guess one way to add on to that is, um, what are your feelings on a 17th game happening and a media contract being signed to allow for the 17th game. Will that, in fact, help um, pick the salary cap, cap above 175? Yeah, I think you're, you're, you have right to anticipate that. I think that the commissioner answered those questions today, but uh, and I think it's and we have the right within the CBA, existing CBA, to go to 17 and 3 or 17 and some other number. I'm not sure what the other number will be. But uh, I, I think it will be a 17, in my opinion, I think it'll be a 17 game season next year. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the players are, you know, are understanding that, accept that, and understand the value of that to them as well as to, you know, our fan base. Um, so uh, I, think that, I think that will help. And I, I do think as a requirement to do that, it's going to require some, you know, some reworking with our media partners. And I think, you know, much like the players, uh, the league has always taken position. These are our partners. And so we don't we can't really impose anything on them, but we can work in a collaborative partnership way to figure out what's the best way for each of the media partners. So it works for everybody. Thank you. Any any more questions, any follow ups? 
Everybody good? Uh, okay. Yeah, well, thank one, you all. One more, Zach. Yeah. Just following up, Arthur, just yeah. we're done talking football. The last, I think, six months, you've given away, what, a quarter billion dollars. Um, mm -hmm. What's next? And a little bit more about what happened today. Well, yeah, thank you, Zach, for bringing it up. Today, we made a $17 million grant to the National Civil and Human Rights Museum, which we've been part of before they broke ground. And uh, they're expanding the museum by uh, close to 50%. So we're happy to have an opportunity to be part of that. It's uh, a rich history of uh, civil and human rights, not only in Atlanta, but the nation and really throughout the world. If our listeners have not visited there, they should do themselves a favor and do it. It's uh, extraordinarily well well done. The expansion space will be used to probably uh, ele elevate and expand the papers of Dr. King. It'll be used for uh, bringing forward some um, exhibits and areas of, um, of exhibition that'll be, let's say, child-friendly, appropriate age child-friendly, because I do think that, I think we all feel as way as parents that uh, the earliest age that we can uh, expose our children to uh, to what is diversity and what is equity and what does equality mean and, uh, and what does kindness mean, all of those things I think are really important. So the museum will be doing a lot of that. I think it'll be much more of a national institution as opposed to just an attraction in Atlanta. Um, and that's good. And they're doing work on a national basis now, but they'll be doing even more so in the future. So uh, really proud to be part of that. And you know, you've heard, all heard me say at one time or another that, you know, over 95 percent of my estates can be recycled back into the foundation. And, um, you know, fortunately, you know, these, you know, these assets that we have in, in, in our in our group of businesses and our investments have done extraordinarily well. So I um, continue to work hard at, um, at, you know, making a difference in terms of philanthropy. Yeah, I will say this. Most people don't. They think it's well. It must be real easy to give away money. It's actually, you know, in some ways, it's harder because you know it takes time to go through and evaluate everything and to be thoughtful about it and understand the impact of it and going back and looking at it did it work or didn't it work, et cetera. So um, it's an opportunity uh, and a responsibility that we feel strongly about. And I'm blessed to say my whole family does, including all of my children, all six of the kids. So um, we'll continue to work in that area and continue to make investments where we can.